good morning to all of us. We have just completed uh, a 21 day lockdown, which is the first lap of this lockdown have I, and I've actually entered into the second lap of lockdown. We really don't know how many more lockdown laps would we have to face as a nation. Uh, there's never been a time in our history, in our life, where we have been so uncertain about the days ahead, where we have been so uncertain about our future. And yet, there's never been a time in history more significant as today to provide us with the opportunity to put our trust and faith in God. We're excited for a yet another Sunday experience with NBCC. We, I really hope you enjoy this time. God bless.
Hello brothers and sisters in Christ, I am Articus Fernandez. I gave my life to Christ at the age of 12. At that point of time, I understood the unfathomable, unimaginable love of God. And I was free and it was unmerited. But somewhere down the line, being in a competitive world, going to school, colleges and workplaces, there was a principle that unless you do something, you don't get back anything. And I tried to apply the same principle to the love of God. I tried to own it. Gospel-centered learning has taught me that the love of God is indeed free and unfathomable. And that I can never do anything to achieve that. That God bestows that freely upon me. And although it is free, the price paid for that love to be acquired by me was great, unimaginable, and that is the death of God's own Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Finally, to conclude, as I learn more about the sinful nature of mine, as I learn more about the holiness of God, I begin to appreciate the cross of Christ in my life. Thank you. Hi. Good morning, church. Today is an amazing day, isn't it? Well, today I'm going to talk about daily Bible reading and meditating on the Word of God. So, to me personally, what I feel is when I read the Word of God, the Word of God has answers to all the problems. So, when you read the Word of God, it's a nourishment to your mind, body and soul. And when you meditate on it, and why do we have to meditate on it? Because we do not fall into the world of sin. As David says, how can a young man keep his way pure? But by living according to the Word of God. So, when we have the Word of God with us, it's a big shield towards the world listen. So my dear friends, I would say, please read the word of God every day and meditate on it day and night so that you will be prosperous and successful. Good morning, church. As we all are going through hard times, we feel anxiety, isolated, mental stress. Some are far from our family, but still, God love is there to take care. Today I would like to share what God has put in my heart from the book of Revelation, chapter 7. Uh, it is a big passage, so you can read in your daily devotion. But I would like to bring for a few promises for us by God. First point, God will place his own shield on his people. God will protect the soul of his people. No matter what happens, they will be brought to the reward of eternal life. So be encouraged and continue to meditate in God's words. And God will take us through this situation and we will soon have victory over it. Stay safe. Good morning to all of us once again. Uh, in NBCC as we start a new sermon series titled The Mystery of Grace. We're going to be uh, looking at the book of Galatians over the next eight weeks and uh, it's not just going to be on a Sunday morning as we hear the live stream on a Sunday morning. It's also going to be followed up by a debrief on Zoom on Wednesday evenings and I trust some of you would be able to join in that. We're going to be looking at the book of Galatians and so quickly let me just give you a background of the book of Galatians. It was written by Paul. It's very clear in the opening verses of uh, chapter 1. It was written perhaps around 49 AD. It's uh, uh, one of Paul's earliest letters uh, and, and, he, and he's written a lot of letters in the New Testament but the letter of, uh, to the churches in Galatia were one of the earliest letters of Paul. Uh, if, if we had to just get a 10 word summary, it would be this of, of the book of Galatians. It would be this. Christians are free from restrictive Jewish laws. Yeah, that's like the whole book in a line. Uh, the opening verses of the book of Galatians reveal to us that this letter was written to a number of churches in the region of Galatia where Paul had traveled on one of his mission trips. And this mission trip is in fact uh, recorded in the book of Acts. And so it's important for us to know this, that he is writing this letter 
from a place of deep passion and frustration at the same time. It's also important that we read it in a manner that matches the author Paul's original intention. Let me just give you the background. Christianity began as a Jewish messianic movement starting in Jerusalem. But the message was for all of humanity and so very quickly it spread beyond Israel and by the time Paul had already been involved in uh, mission trips outside of Israel, there were as many non-Jews as the number of Jews that were a part of this movement now. And so this became a huge debate if you read Acts chapter 15. We're not going to look at it right now. It's giving a background. And so historically, the covenant people of God were focused on one ethnicity that was Israel. They were set apart by the practices that were commanded in the book of law. And you read it in, uh, in the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Deuteronomy uh, and so some of the practices were things like circumcision, dietary laws, Sabbath laws and many many more. Not many of the Jews, sorry, now many of the Jews believed that for all these non-Jews to truly become a part of God's family, even they needed to comply to all these practices and laws. So much so, some of these Jewish Christians ended up going to the region of Galatia and undermined Paul's initial message when he went on the mission trip. They demanded that these non-Jews practice things like circumcision and, and probably other demands as well. And when Paul finds out, he is heartbroken. He is angry. And this letter was a result of that. It's coming from a place, like I said, of deep passion and frustration at the same time. But before we go ahead, I'd like to think, I'd like you to think of some of the ethnic, ethnic problems that even we may have today in the 21st century in the church. I don't think I would be wrong when I say in matters of marriage, in matters of close friendships, in matters of uh, uh, roles of women and gender inequality, social classes divide, judging people on the way they look or the way they dress, racism, in all these aspects, it's true to say that the views on ethnicity or the views that we, the voices that we hear from society seems to take a higher priority than the gospel message. And when Paul finds out that the priority of the gospel message has been compromised. He is heartbroken and he is angry. The outline, the structure of the book of Galatians is such, he, he starts off his first part introducing uh, and, and, and the occasion for the letter. He goes on to defend his own personal defense uh, of the gospel. And then he goes on to have a theological defense of the gospel and then he ends the last couple of chapters by practical uh, by practically applying the gospel and what does it look like uh, in daily life if you could just follow with me we're going to be reading the first part we're only going to be focusing on the first nine verses for today Galatians chapter 1 verses 1 to 9 I'm reading from the NIV version Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of God our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. 
evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be under God's curse. As we have already said, and now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. So first, in, the, in verses 1 and 2, Paul says that he has been sent with divine authority. In fact, the Greek word of apostolos means to be sent. The amplified version says, that word, when you amplify, the version says, like a special messenger appointed and commissioned to be sent out. Paul strongly phrases that he has come not from men or not by man. He drives home the uniqueness of his call. He is saying that he did not receive this commission from any man. He was commissioned and taught directly by the risen Jesus Christ himself. So a summary of verses 3 and 4, in, in, uh, sorry, in, from verses 3 to 5, Paul in fact summarizes the entire gospel story in a couple of sentences. So he says in verse 4, the word he uses, rescue. First we learn that we are helpless and lost. That's what the word rescue implies in verses 4. Second, we learn that what was done to rescue us? What was done? Jesus. What did Jesus do? Jesus made a sacrifice in order to rescue us. Third, we learn why God did it. And this is very important for us. It was done all out of grace. Not because of anything we have done, but according to the will of God. And so in verses 3, 4 and 5, he summarizes the entire gospel story, implying we did not even ask for rescue, but Jesus came according to the will of God the Father. We did not even deserve rescue, but Jesus came according to the will of the Father. There is no indication or no other motivation for the cause of Christ's mission on earth apart from the will of God the Father. And so before he goes on, he actually starts off this letter with a summary of what's the gospel story. What is Paul's mood when he writes this letter? And I'm reading from verses 6 now. He uses the word astonish. Paul is surprised. He is astonished. But the Greek word here used is a word called thaumazo. The word thaumazo actually means marvel. Think of the feeling of shock, surprise and worry. The last time I went through this feeling was uh, when I realized Arya had started somersaulting on the bed. I was worried that she shouldn't fall off the bed. That's a glimpse of shock, surprise and worry, astonish, marvel she can do something great, but shock that she could just fall off the bed. So along with the shock comes anxiety and worry. And I'd like to stress, I'd like to stress Paul's mood, Paul's emotion at this time. The, Gal the people in Galatia are taking hold of a gospel that isn't really a gospel, if you read verse 7. They have turned to another message which is not the gospel. And Paul realizes they are in an amount of enormous danger. In fact, verse 7 even reveals to us that they are in a place of confusion. He's astonished, he's shocked, he's worried. All because the people in the Galatian region have turned to a gospel that is not really a gospel. And he knows that now they are in danger. But second, Paul also seems to be angry. 
His language is remarkably stinging. It's like pricking. It has the ability to cause pain. He is directly angry at the ones who are misleading the people of Galatia. So the Greek word used over here, and just give me a minute as I try to, tarasontes. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but tarasontes. It actually means disturbing or troubling. He is angry because people are disturbing and troubling the people of Galatia. So Paul lang Paul's language seems to be so sharp, so crisp, because he's angry, he seems to be angry at some of the Jews who were troubling the churches in Galatia by teaching them a distorted, a wrong gospel. He refers to them as some people who are trying to pervert the gospel. In fact, in verse 9, he is calling down a condemnation, a curse on them. These are strong words by Paul. Enough to instill pain. And so, uh, indirectly, he is also angry at the people of Galatia themselves. He is warning them that you are quickly deserting the God who called you in verses 6. Now that's a serious charge. He is, he is uh, uh, accusing them of deserting, of quickly deserting God. That they are personally turning their backs on God. But here's an important message for all of us. Not just the people of Galatia, but for all of us. And the important message is this. That any change to the gospel makes the gospel null, void and empty. And why is this so? Why is this so? In verse 6, Paul says that we are, uh, sorry, in, in verse 6 Paul says that we are called by the grace of Christ. This means that God called us. We didn't call God. God called us. And this also means when we are called into the grace of Christ, it means that God accepts us right away despite our lack of merit. Friends, that's the order of the gospel. God accepts us and then we follow God. It's not the other way around. Every other uh, view apart from the gospel, any other religiousistic view, any other uh, world view, have it the other way around. We must give something to God. We must follow a system and then if we are good at it, we gain acceptance. The gospel is different. The order of the gospel is God first initiates, God accepts us and then we, call, we are called to follow him. Unfortunately, the people in Galatia were deserting him. And so the people who were suggesting, these Jewish Christians who were suggesting that the Galatians should simply you know, add the, uh, the, the requirements and the practices of the Mosaic law, like you know, ceremonial law, Sabbath laws, dietary laws, is a complete revision, it's a complete reversal of the gospel message because now there is a, a possibility that the people in Galatia conclude that if I do the Mosaic law, then I will be accepted. And Paul is angry because the gospel message has just been reversed. In verses, in fact, he uses the word perverts. In verses 7, we are told that this kind of teaching that these people have been giving, the people in Galatia, have literally reversed and perverts the gospel. It's amazing. It's amazing. If you add anything to Christ, if you add anything else to Christ as a requirement for acceptance with God, even today, we completely reverse the gospel. If, if Christ plus something is required for God to accept us, and that, which means Christ is not enough, it's a reversal, it's a perversion of the gospel message. And so, quite literally, Paul says, another gospel, which is no gospel really. 
so crystal clear, so striking. Another gospel is no gospel at all. Martin Luther quotes this. If you do not build your confidence on the work of Christ, you have no option but to build your confidence on your own work. Let's just quickly go on. So we need to realize, if you believe what Paul believed about the gospel, we find his attitude justifiable. If the Galatians are really turning their backs onto God and laying hold of a gospel that is really no gospel at all, they are in an enormous amount of danger. Their condition is dangerous. And so the anxiety and anger that Paul expresses is just like a loving parent or a loving friend who would express if a child or their friend, you know, were seriously going astray. And so even his strong, striking, sharp comments that he is making, the language he is using, is actually motivated by a lot of love and compassion, not arrogance. It's motivated by love. So adding to the gospel is a problem even today. Many people think that they are saved because of the level of faith they have. But the gospel says that we are saved through our faith, not because of our faith. If we believe that we are saved because of our faith, then we make, uh, uh, then this approach really makes our performance the savior. Our ability, you know, the, the ability to grow in faith, that make, uh, we conclude that that saves us. But when we say that we are saved through our faith, that makes Christ's performance our savior. So, the, so adding to the gospel is a problem even today because it is not the level of faith that saves us but, but the object of faith on who we are having faith that saves us. That saves us. And so what is Paul's uh, attitude towards those who pervert the gospel, those who spoil the gospel, those who distort the gospel? What is Paul's attitude? So first he says in verses 8, if, and notice the language so clearly, if we should preach a gospel other than the one that you heard, let him be eternally condemned. It's remarkable that he's saying the words we. He is including himself. He is saying that if ever he says, I've changed my mind about the gospel, he must be rejected. That's what he is saying. His whole argument in the, in, in the first two chapters of Galatians is that the gospel did not come to him as a process of reasoning and reflecting. He says it's a gospel that he received. Therefore, he is not free to alter it by reasoning and reflecting because it's something that he just received. Second, in verses 8, he says that, and, 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 and this is very important for all of us. He says that even if we had a vision, let me just read that verse actually. Verses 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Strong statement. So he says that even if we had a vision in which an angel came literally and appeared and gave us a different message from the gospel, he's saying that's an invalid source. It's an invalid source. In other words, friends, for us, this is very important today because we need to realize that our experience must be parallel. In fact, it must be judged by the gospel. The gospel cannot be judged by our experience. Our experience must be judged by the gospel message. And this is a very astonishing claim. 
it means that the final measurable, the final yardstick, the final plumb line for truth is not our personal experience with the teachings found in the Bible. That's the final measurable. We do not judge the Bible by our experience or by our feelings or by our convictions. In fact, we judge our experience, we judge our feelings, we judge our conviction by what the Bible says. I'd like to conclude in the next five minutes. Why is Paul so uncompromising? And why should you and I also be so uncompromising when it comes to the word of God? So he says in verse 6, I'm going to give three reasons and then I'm going to just conclude. First he says in verse 6, you are deserting the one who called you. Paul is saying that when you abandon the true message of the gospel, you are abandoning Christ personally. You are deserting God. You are deserting the one who called you. In other words, a difference in your understanding of what you believe leads you to a difference in your understanding of who Jesus is. I am going to repeat this again. A difference in our understanding of what we believe in the Bible leads to a difference in our understanding of who Jesus is. Second, he says in verses 6 and 7 actually, a different gospel is no gospel at all. It really means that the gospel message by its very nature cannot be changed even slightly or else it will be lost totally. The message of the gospel is that we are saved by grace through the finished work of Christ on the cross and nothing else. And as soon as we do anything to add to that saving, to that salvation, we have lost it entirely. The third reason why Paul is so uncompromising and why you and I should be so uncompromising is because a different message, a different gospel brings condemnation. Reading from verses 8 and 9. I'm reading from verses 9. As we have already said, and now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. He says that a different gospel brings a curse along with them. This means that ultimately to alter the gospel and to, and, and to be under God's curse is actually playing with eternal life and death. It also means very practically that fear, anxiety and guilt that's what condemnation does to us. It instills fear, anxiety and guilt. Will always be attached to a different gospel. I'm going to repeat this again. Because I think it's very crucial for each of us. It means that practically fear, anxiety and guilt. Which is a sense of curse and condemnation. Will always be attached with a different gospel message. In fact, as we stay on and you read later on the book, in the book of Galatians, you see that Christians sometimes experiences that sense of condemnation. And when they do, when Christians experience that sense of condemnation, it's because they are functionally, maybe just for that moment also, but functionally, they are trusting in a different message altogether. They are trusting and believing that there is probably a different way to earn salvation. I'm just closing with verses 3, 4 and 5, the summary of the gospel story that Paul gives. He says in chapter 1, 3, 4 and 5, 
grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to add a couple of lines and I want to just say it's possibly understandable that some of you may have questions or doubts or need clarity. Right? In order for us, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, uh, because of that, we are arranging a debriefing session on Wednesday evening. In fact, every Wednesday for the next eight weeks. That's the first thing. The second thing I want to say is, while we look at, I mean, I, and I even mentioned it earlier, while I said the order of the gospel is that God accepts us first and then we follow. I don't mean that if God accepts us, we don't need to follow. We need to follow. Okay, and we're going to be looking at that in the next eight weeks. But all our works, all that we do, all our good works, is not in pursuit of God's acceptance. It's a result of God's acceptance. I really wish you, I, I really wish all of you a lovely week ahead, even as together we all dig into scripture and see the richness and beauty of it. Thank you for listening. Well, we trust that you've been blessed with the time of worship, the time of the testimonies and the prophetic word and the sermon as well. We, uh, we will be continuing this talk on the mystery of grace as a teaching study for the next eight weeks. Uh, and if you, have, if you need more clarity and if you have more questions for the next eight Wednesdays as well, we have an, uh, 45 minutes every Wednesday evening where we'll be debriefing all that we studied on Sunday morning. We, we hope that you would join us for that. At this time, we, we want to leave opportunity to honor God with our tithes and our offering in obedience to the word of God and in view of God's mercy and grace by sending Jesus for us, giving all that he could ever give. We choose to honor God and obey him by putting forward our tithes and our offerings. The account details should be coming on your screen right about now. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of this NBCC service. May God's love, the grace of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us. Have a lovely week ahead. God bless.